This place in the summer is absolutely buzzing. Um, I love working here in the summer. Uh, it becomes a real riot of colour and interest in the summer, um, and also a riot of people, so <laughs> it's a very busy garden. The summer months are about our summer displays, and our summer displays in colour terms are probably our most spectacular. Well, I designed them. Uh, this year has been a very special year, being Hampton Court Palace 500. The six beds along the front were from previous decades and the carpet bedding that you probably saw a lot there, that was Victorian. Uh, we're deadheading the pelagonium so that they flower again, that keeps them flowering, it makes it look nice. The big challenge through the summer is um, keeping on top of everything. Um, we've got you know mowing, weeding, edging, hedge cutting, all different operations um, that we need to keep on top of. Well this is a spider lawnmower. We used to use a fly mow on a rope where you used to stand at the top of the bank and hold the rope down and just let the fly mow sort of hang. But this is a remote control mower. There's only about three or four in the country. This is a lot better than doing it with a fly mower and a bit of rope. Well, at the moment I'm maintaining Queen Mary II's exotics collection, which we bring out to the lower orangery for the summer months. Um, usually they're in the glass houses where I, where I take care of them. Um, but while they're out here, I have to pop out every now and again. Um, I've just been trimming these utopiaries. Um, it's a regular job that we do this time of year, just, just to keep them looking smart and nice and to maintain the shape. As the maze is 500 years old, we're having to try to rejuvenate it. So one way of doing that, apart from replanting the hedge, is to cut it back as hard as we can. And you can see here we've already got growth starting. These are yew trees and they date back to William and Mary. And they're cut every year uh, to get rid of the excess growth and to keep their shape and health. We use what's called a cherry picker or a nifty lift. Otherwise, it used to be done by ladders, but for health and safety reasons, that was far too dangerous. Summer is, is, is the colourful time in the gardens. It's, it's, the, it's the absolute show time. The highlight for me is knowing the rose garden preps in my T-shirt and the sun on my back. And it's one of the peak uh, productive seasons in a kitchen garden. So most of the beds are now full uh, and they're producing things for us to harvest uh, and we're harvesting weekly and we are selling it at a market store. The grapevine is the oldest and largest grapevine in the world. The longest branch which was measured in the winter is 120 foot and the whole vine is nearly 250 years old planted in 1768. I'm just taking off any shriveled or damaged grapes or any that aren't perhaps quite good enough for eating so that they're as, um, as perfect as we can manage them. We're wrapping in cellophane, a piece of ribbon. I think if a gardener from 300 years ago came to visit the gardens today, they'd be quite surprised at how scientific it can be. You've got to know about uh, soil fertility, how to maintain that over time. Um, if you don't, then you know your crops are going to suffer. Home Park is one of the more unfamiliar areas of the gardens for most of our visitors. Uh, it has recently been designated a triple SI, meaning it's an area of special scientific interest. Hampton Court here in Home Park has a herd of fallow deer. And at the moment with the fawns, it's probably a holding herd of about 400. This time of year is obviously when the deer are having their young with their fawns. They've got the trees, they've got the acorns, got the chestnuts, they've got the grass, they've got the acid grass, and they're actually spot rotten at the moment. The Magic Garden is a new garden that we've created specifically for children to enjoy playing in and I think when children actually get in there they won't have experienced a garden like that anywhere else, certainly in England and probably in Europe as well. Uh, the challenge is will it be finished in time and the, the finish date is Easter 2016. Um, I think we're a little bit behind um, but that's because there's so many elements of the garden to build. We always get things done, always. Uh, I started in 1999 after a career in the city as in investment banking. It, it's yeah. quite, quite a leap, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I love the people, I love the place, and I love horticulture. It is, it's, it's the best job in the world. Um, I'm surprised they pay me at the end of the month, to be honest. You know, I don't think, oh, I'm going to work. I think, great, I'm coming in here. I'm learning every day. You never stop learning when you're a gardener. I've been here, as I said, eight years now, and I'm still learning about the history of the gardens. And the team, everyone says hello to everyone. They all smile and wave. If they go past on a vehicle, we wave and smile to each other. There's no happier place. It's lovely. These jobs are like winning the lottery, and that's how every day I take it. It's like winning the lottery and I feel very, very privileged.
best thing to see in uh, the autumn for me would be uh, the different tree colours. Reds, uh, browns, oranges, yellows. Even when they've fallen off the tree, I think they look quite pretty on the floor until we suck them all up. <laughs> We roughly get around anywhere between the sort of 70 to 80 tonnes worth of leaves uh, which we take down to our barn which then get recycled for leaf mulch. It's, it's a key time of year for us when we're changing the planting schemes over from the summer schemes to the winter schemes. I'm uh, looking at which ones aren't performing well enough to stay for another season and I'm uh, rearranging the colours a little to make, um, make it a bit more showy for next year. These are all of the pumpkins that we grew this year in the kitchen garden and they've been brought inside to have a final few weeks of, of ripening and that really helps them to um, get hard skin which makes them store better and it also improves the flavour because the flesh sort of gets denser and sweeter. But hopefully we'll have them ready for Halloween because everyone wants them for Halloween. Well what we're doing this time of year, this is during October and early November as we're bringing in the exotic plants which are part of our national collection. Uh, it's Queen Mary's the Second's Exotics. So we've been bringing them in uh, using a, a forklift truck. It's the easiest and most simple and safest way to bring these into the nursery. We plant over 200,000 bulbs each autumn. So I think getting those all into the ground in time is, uh, is probably the biggest challenge we face at that time of year. <laughs> we all suffer from backache. No, some of us suffer from backache. And, uh, uh, you get into quite interesting positions while you're doing the planting. So. You can see for yourself. <laughs> it's a time when you're, uh, well, we are thinking of uh, our winter projects, which most of us find more interesting than the day-to-day the -day maintenance of the summer months. You can spray things or, you know, put in biological control after you've got a problem. But if you don't have the problem to begin with, like that's the best way of tackling it. So keeping things really clean, tidy, just really good housekeeping is a great way to stop problems just destroying all your crops. Even visiting Home Park where it begins to start looking a little bit bleaker now and, and it looks lovely on some frosty mornings if you can get, get out there. There's some great shots you can get by camera. So the male deer normally all have the poor feeding area and the females have all the good feeding area and they all sort of stick together. The males are in the peak of what you would class as the fallow rut, which is in layman's terms mating season. Now they've got hatred for each other because they want to be alpha male to breed with all the females. So we'd work up at the palace, giving rise to the visitors and today as it's near the end of the season we're also working out the back. We want the least amount of impact out there and horses do that. You can't find us if we're working out there because we don't make any noise, you know, it's not like if you've got a chainsaw or, uh, you know, a strimmer. There were a million of these horses a hundred years ago. At the beginning of the First World War in England, there were a million shy horses. And now worldwide, there are only 1,500. You can't keep these horses as pets, they eat too much. A horse like that will eat a dustbin full of short feed a day, plus hay, you know, so they have to have a job. And they're happier working. You get to meet loads of people, you know, and you get to tell them things about the horses and the palace. And I never get fed up. I say the same things over and over again about these horses, but I never get fed up with talking about them, you know. They're my babies, really, so there you go. We've got a wonderful bunch of people, all ages, um, all, all personalities. At lunchtime, we get a chance to play pool or darts where we have a friendly competition for a nominal fee. Yeah, well, I've, pl I've played for the last 27 years, so I, I keep my hand in, but I don't tell them that. <laughs> got radio, we've got towels, power tools, beer. Been doing the raffle for about 15 years. TV. Started off just in the actual gardens, then it got to known throughout the palace, and we've just gone bigger and bigger over the years. Some people get carried away buying tickets, they'll buy 60 quid to 100 pounds worth of tickets. I just like raising the money for different charities. Yeah, we always put forward a selection of charity options each year and then we'll kind of vote amongst us which one we all feel is the most worthwhile. Yeah, yeah, I'm quite proud, you know, I'm following in Capability Brown's footsteps and he's probably one of our most famous gardeners and yeah, I'll be glad to pass that on to my grandchildren and children that I've been part of working in such a spectacular place. You can start with a seed and end up with a tree. The tree behind me is a tree that I planted in 1977. This tree thrives in amongst other trees. We're just on a journey here looking after these gardens. It wasn't a dead straight boring stem and also it's got very attractive deep veined bark which is another reason why I selected the tree. 
And I think that sort of seeing that transformation is a wonderful thing to be able to, to, uh, to do and to work with those sort of things. All the naked branches on the trees, the fantastic silhouettes, the wonderful sunrises and sunsets and the lights that you get only at this time of the year on the long water. We've got a saying in the gardens, you know, gardeners don't hibernate in the winter. And that's because that's when we really do all of our work. If you don't do your work in the winter, you won't have a display from the spring round to the following autumn. At this time of the year, we're trying to divide all the herbaceous um, borders, um, but the problem being January, that a lot of the ground is very frozen, so we're trying to get on, but it's just slowing down the job, really, because you can see that it's totally too hard. You're just digging in ice. When it, hopefully by lunchtime, it'll defrosted and we'll add the manure, basically rake over the ground, level it, and the plants are put back as soon as possible. We've just been uh, we've doing some mulching on the tree circles. So we have to redo it every two or three years because it breaks down so it's not all sitting down drinking tea as uh, it probably used to be in the old days maybe. At the moment we are winter supplement feeding our deer which is part of our uh, deer management program because there's still loads of grass but all the nutrients have gone from the grass. At the moment the male deer have gone through a rut which has taken about like, eight weeks and they've been not eating for eight weeks so they're at their leanest and the females have been for the last six months been weaning their fawns. There is nowhere, nowhere else they can go, so it's our duty to really to get them through the lean period. If you put it all in a condensed area, the males, the bucks, being sort of greedy, typical man, would literally just scoff the lot. So we put it in a great big long line so everyone gets their feel. You should roughly feed about a kilo of this per deer per day, and this stuff is not cheap. We do a lot of uh, path repairs, with a lot of wooden edging repairs in the beds. Um, or hard landscaping path repairs and things like that. So we're trying to make a, a wider path, which wise it's going to be about two, three feet wider than it was. And we're also putting a, a wooden edge, just a permanent edge, so you can see where you should be driving. So it's not really gardening, it's more like labouring, but someone's got to do it. There's so much going on in the winter, more than people think actually. Turfing, uh, we do a lot of manuring. Um, and pruning. Um, we start off by cutting out any dead or diseased wood, anything in the middle here, crossing stems, we clean it up, creating a wine glass effect, which is the right environment for a rose to grow healthily. You can't prune when there's a heavy frost on the floor, so we have to wait for the frost to lift. Obviously hazards have fallen, so you need a decent pair of gloves and a decent pair of trousers, but it's well worth it when you see it in June. It's one of those jobs I personally don't think you ever stop learning about because there's always new techniques, new machinery coming on board. These guys need machines and they need them maintained. So, I mean, if you see some of the old pictures of what machines they used to use, and instead of using a, a, a like a petrol hedge cutter, they would use shears. Yeah, I've been I've been taking things apart since I was about seven or eight years old. With um, my dad going mad that I'm taking my toys apart, and I just got it. We have the. Remote control one. This one. It's even got a start button, chainsaws. Then we go to new technology, which is the battery powered machines. This one we use to cut the east front lawns. If you've been out there, and that's one of the bigger, bigger, biggest cutting machine we've got at the moment. It's one of the little tractors there. That one's the little one. As you can see, this is the Massey Ferguson, and it's used to cut. Uh, some of the meadows out the back in the in home park. It's a little mini road sweeper mowing deck. There's blades under there, and therefore like doing the park, the grass, like scissors, but very fast. Well, I've actually worked on this site for 33 years, and I've been in charge for 25. I mean, I personally have been here 45 years this year. I was, I was 16 when I started. It's a very diverse profession and if you live to be 300 you wouldn't crack it all. The first two years I hardly said boo to a goose. I was very, very quiet. I was a very quiet person. Yes, it has definitely changed me. It's made me feel I'm good about myself and uh, yes, I feel, yeah. There's a board outside the office with all the names of all the head gardeners that have worked at Hampton Court over the years. 
you it, it makes you realize you know that you do stand on the shoulders of giants that some of the greatest gardeners uh, in this country uh, have worked there with a garden of this age it is a contribution of many many people's work over many many centuries and this is just your time with your people so it's it's about stewardship and it's about continuity and it's about um, heritage nature perfected that's what you're after you're after the best possible job you can achieve and it's always lovely when you get members of public coming up and saying oh, wow how wonderful the gardens are and that always gives you a good buzz and a good kick. People have been saying wow about these gardens for hundreds of years and to know that we've still got the wow factor is the thing that gives me the greatest sense of achievement. Well, spring is really when you start to see the fruits of your labours come to life. It's kind of a, a time of lots of hope. There's a real sense of expectancy, I think. Yeah, we're all really excited for spring. <laughs> really excited. And you'll see out in the wilderness all the, the paths uh, we cut. They're just absolutely beautiful. Just the, everything's starting to grow and you're starting to get like vague smells of the gardens. It just smells like heaven. Daffodil, like... Scent is one of my absolute favourites, and there's so many different types, bicoloured or tricoloured. It's just beautiful. It's a really, really lovely time. And everyone just seems a little happier as well. Today we're going to be cutting the footpaths, the grass paths that are just in front of me here with a ride-on machine. Um, these paths originate back to William and Mary's time, and every fortnight we cut um, the paths in to stop the bulbs from popping up everywhere. Spring means sunshine and flowers and growth, and it's just so exciting seeing like little seedlings popping up. It's springtime and we're in the nursery. First of all, we have to have a tray. Just put your, some compost in there. And then you get your, it's not a lot. It's easy, really. You need to put your seeds in the top. And we've got to put them in our prop house. When they're big enough, you can take them out and then you just stick them in your pot. I mean, just let them grow, really, until they're ready to go out. It's about 30,000 in the summer. We're currently in the citrus house in the nursery, and at this time of year, we, we prune back the citruses um, to get them into shape, ready to go out in the summer. Well, right now, we'll be preparing our paths, finishing off some of our big winter projects like the Magic Garden. Yeah, the Magic Garden is going very well. We're on the final push now, and the garden will be ready to open in the spring. Today, we've got the um, tractor rake out, and the purpose of it is really to give that final groomed effect to the uh, path. But we like to do it sort of uh, ideally uh, about six times a year. We're doing our best to improve habitats for a whole variety of, of species. We've got these bat boxes which we're going to install in various trees around the gardens and the estates. There's no, it's all rough sawn wood so they, they just grip onto here and crawl up into the, the gap. And um, these are bones that we've recovered from um, and owl pellets that we found in the park. So these are from barn owl pellets. When mink pass through they'll leave their footprints and these are casts of the footprints and this indicates that there's presence of mink on site. And these are fallow deer antlers that um, have fallen off some of the deer in the park and they're going to be put into the interpretation cart for the, for the gardens. We're in Home Park, um, it's still very very cold I'm afraid and we're preparing the tree crates because the, uh, the deer are breaking them all up where the antlers are very itchy. Uh, but it's protecting the young trees, otherwise if they take all the bark off both sides, they, um, the tree will die. So every single tree that's young will have a tree crate around it. Uh, today we're doing the potholes, so obviously we store our materials in that lot down here. So yeah, we'll be doing potholes down the uh, This is the barn, um, and this is where we store all our materials, um, and also we do all our waste, our recycling waste. We've probably been recycling our green waste now for about 15 years. We've got wood chip, we've got leaf mould, We've got horse manure, we have shredded green material, and we end up with this. To take something that's dead, and then to put it back onto something, and then you can see all new growth coming through, the benefits, the water retention, the weed suppressant that it gives. It's just amazing. We absolutely love and adore this place, and at the same time feel absolutely privileged to work here. 
you want to be able to look after it because you want to be able to see it grow, flower, fruit and eventually maybe even outlive you. We're just here in a snapshot of time. These gardens have been running for three, four hundred years. We're only here for a little bit in our lives, but we're going to make the most of it. We've got a great sign on um, the barrow that we sell the plants on and it says like growers of flowers for like 400 years and to be part of that history is something really special. I think it's really lovely to think of the work that we're doing now being history for someone else. I think that's really lovely.